Hey guys, welcome to this week's episode. Uh, we just did the meet uh, the collection video on Thursday and I used Lilith. And uh, so I decided for this video, I'm gonna use a snake that I call Mini Lilith. This is one of Lilith's daughters uh, that I kept. And although genetically speaking, she didn't really show anything that I really wanted. She's like a little mini clone of what Lilith looked like as a baby. And so being sentimental, here I am and kept a miniature version, only uh, like seven years younger than her mother. Uh, so anyway, she's gonna be my help for today's video. And uh, what I wanna talk about today is the subject of enrichment. And just to be clear up front, a lot of what I'm gonna tell you is gonna be my opinion. Um, it's gonna be based on my own research, based on my own experience, based on the experience of other people that I trust, and also based on you know all these different studies that I've read on the concept of enrichment. Uh, now the first thing when we're evaluating scientific studies, obviously you want stuff that's peer reviewed and, and things along those, those lines. We wanna also look at who's funding the research. A lot of times you'll find with some of these studies that uh, a certain corporation or company is funding the research. And the way that that works is if that company's funding the research and you constantly get answers that are gonna be detrimental to their products, uh, you're often not gonna get that funding anymore. Uh, so you do wanna pay attention to some of those things and make sure that you're really paying attention to the sources. Unfortunately, it'd be great to live in a world where money doesn't really drive everything, but it really does. Uh, and so we always wanna pay attention to where money's changing hands and how that might affect some of the information that we're looking at. Now that said, um, you know, what is enrichment really? And when most people hear enrichment, they think of like fun and activities and things like that. But in the realm of, of these animals, uh, what enrichment is, is really actually them trying to survive in a wild environment. So we're talking about climbing, swimming, you know, burrowing, uh, basking, all those things that are, are considered enrichment activities really are the animal just trying to survive. And out in the wild and out in nature, uh, conditions are constantly changing, things are constantly fluctuating, there's predators, you know, obviously they have to hunt for their food, they have to find clean water sources, they have to move and live, you know, near where those, those steady water sources are, obviously species dependent, your desert species are going to be different, they're going to get a lot more of their their water from their food. Not that these guys don't get some of their, their water from their food as well, but they're also active drinkers, as anybody knows, that keeps them, especially bloods and short tails that are often found in swampy areas. They're never really very far from water, uh, typically. So, and that's an important thing to consider when we're setting up caging, is the species in question. Uh, something like this, a short tail is an ambush predator. And these guys are about as ambush predator as ambush predator gets. So their natural behavior is to sit still in the same spot, sometimes for weeks on end, and wait for food to come to them. Whereas an active hunter is gonna go out and pursue food, whether it be in a tree, in a bush, underground, uh, you know, just along the leaf litter, wherever that animal's niche is, and whatever prey it's after. Uh, so there are different ways that snakes hunt, and thus different behavior that's going to be ingrained in those animals. So we have to remember, this animal is captive bred. This animal's never been in a wild environment before. It doesn't know what a wild environment is. Uh, it has certain things ingrained in it instinctually, and it has, you know, it's geared to survive in a certain niche, obviously. So we wanna have our caging set up to where we're keeping our temperatures and humidity within their range. We also wanna take into account their natural behavior, which is to be an ambush predator. So they're gonna to wanna to hide not only from predators, but also from prey. They wanna be able to, in this species specifically, sit in a spot where they can see all around them, but they don't feel like they can be seen. Uh, so when you're setting up their caging, you wanna give them an environment that kinda of gives them that opportunity uh, and lets them exhibit some of that natural behavior. Uh, so also when we're considering stuff, is a species we're keeping fossorial is it arboreal? Is it semi-arboreal? If that's something that, that applies, then you do wanna give that animal an opportunity to use those natural instincts that are built into it. So a fossorial species likes to burrow, you know, because they're gonna typically live underground. So you want to, uh, to give them that opportunity. And now that doesn't mean you can't do that with newspaper or aspen or all different substrates, depending on the species you're keeping. 
It's just how much of it you give them so that they can get that behavior. Like with newspaper, if you give them 17 layers of newspaper, they can go in between layers and different depths and they can exercise that natural behavior. You don't necessarily need to give them a foot of dirt to do it. Uh, and once again, it's species dependent. Uh, you know, like if we're talking about larger monitors that like to dig, they need that substrate to dig in. That's important for them. Uh, but for snakes, they just need to feel like they're underneath something and in that secure place in most species. So you can do that in a number of different ways. Um, and so we want to use those natural behaviors as a basis, but we want to adapt to the fact that we're keeping captive bred animals. Now, if we're removing an animal from the wild and the eventual plan is to re-release that animal into a wild, then enrichment is super important because you want that animal to behave as if it's out in the wild. You want that animal actively hunting food. You want that animal actively concerned about predation. You want that animal actively, you know, trying to thermoregulate and, and all those things that it's going to have to do to survive. You don't want to, you know, back that animal down from those natural instincts, which is why if we're keeping a wild caught snake that's going to be released, we try not to handle it. We try to be minimally invasive because you don't want to teach them that humans are not a threat. You know, we want to continue to be a threat to them. Whereas this snake, I want to learn that I'm not a threat because this snake is going to be a pet. It's going to live in a captive environment. It's going to live with me every day. So if it feels that I'm a threat, that's going to be very stressful for the animal. Obviously, you can see she does not feel I'm a threat. She doesn't care. She's just doing her thing. Going up my face. Uh, so that's very important. And, uh, you know, you'll, you'll read these studies and they'll tell you there's all kinds of benefits to enrichment. Most of the benefits that I've read that I can find are benefits to wild caught animals versus captive bred. So you'll see stuff like, you know, animals that are given all this enrichment have better problem solving abilities. Do you want an animal that's kept in a cage to problem solve and figure out how to get out of that cage? I don't. So I don't see how that's a benefit to a captive bred animal that's going to stay in a captive environment. Uh, they don't need to problem solve. That's our job. Our job is to make sure that they have everything they need and that they don't have to do those kinds of things. That's part of what being a good keeper is, is handling all that stuff for our animals so they can just be themselves. They don't have to think about, oh, I need to go escape predation or, oh, I need to go find food. And that doesn't mean, you know, if you're feeding your snake every two weeks by, you know, day 11 or 12, they're not out looking for food. Uh, you know, instinct tells them I've got to start because they're going to fail so many times naturally. In captivity, obviously, they don't fail unless they choose not to eat. Uh, because we, you know, gift wrap everything for them. Uh, you know, and, and you want to look at the fact uh, everything that we're doing within their environment is essentially trying to create a homeostasis. We're trying to get that cage to stay with what they need, regardless of what happens in the room around it. Uh, so anything that we do, our heat source, our cage size, all those things, we need to factor in and make sure we're doing appropriately. One of the things that drives me nuts about the people that are really, really heavy into every snake needs all this enrichment is that they'll call anything else minimalistic keeping. And I have a very different opinion on what's minimalistic. Uh, to me, you know, even if the snake's kept on paper with a water dish in a tub, if it has proper gradient, has proper heat source, it has everything that, you know, it properly needs, it's on good equipment, I don't think that's minimalistic at all. I think you're doing everything that that animal needs. Um, I think minimalistic is when somebody goes out and gets like the Petco set up special and throws their ball python in a tank with a half log and some dirt with a heat lamp. I don't really think that, I think that's more minimalistic because your heat source isn't properly controlled. It's going to be unregulated. You know, the glass environment for a snake that wants to, you know, feel secure is not really conducive to that. You know, a half log hide isn't really conducive to that species either because that species wants to hide in a way where it feels secure and it feels like it only has to defend itself from one position, whereas a half log is open on two sides, so they're going to feel like they're vulnerable in the back or the front wherever they sit. Uh, so there's different things to think about with stuff like that. Now also, um, when you go field herping and you go looking for snakes, you know, snakes have a natural environment. So if we're looking for a fossorial species, you might have to dig a hole to find them, or you might have to catch them when they're out basking if they bask. But think about when you're field herping, what do you go to and what do you look at? You're often flipping over boards, you're looking in wood piles, you're uh, flipping over you know, large metal pieces that are out you know, in the woods for some reason. Those are not natural environments for snakes, and yet we find them there in the wild when they have the choice which goes to show you that a snake is looking for functionality over the substance. They don't care if it's a 
log pile you made. They don't care if it's your shed. They don't care if it's a piece of metal that's not natural that's out on the ground. If it provides them what they need, then that's what they're using. Uh, so when you see these people that are like, well, well, it should look naturalistic, a captive bred snake doesn't know the difference between a cardboard box hide, a plastic hide, and a hollowed out log. It's all the same to them. It's the security they're looking for. They're not looking for a certain material or substance. Uh, so I think that that whole idea that it has to be naturalistic looking is for the keeper. It's not for the snake. This snake doesn't know the difference between a plant that's native to Indonesia and a plant that's native to North America. It has no idea, no idea at all. It's never been to Indonesia, it's never been to Borneo, it's never been anywhere in its natural environment, it's never seen its natural environment, its mother and father have never seen its natural environment. They know what we keep them in. And so an important thing to remember with this is complex versus simple emotions. Snakes don't exhibit complex emotions because they can't. They don't have that little portion in the brain that we do that tells us, you know, we're happy, we're sad, we're bored. Snakes don't get bored. So the idea of enrichment is encouraging them natural behaviors, but it's not because they're bored. It's not gonna curtail that. That's not a thing that they experience. Uh, so it's really not something that they have to have for a captive bred snake. And I'm not saying that if you wanna give your snake enrichment, you shouldn't, I'm not opposed to it. I just really feel like it's wrong for these people that go out there and they have no basis to say that, you know, keeping your snake on paper with a water dish in a, in a tub that it's happy in, you know, quote unquote, uh, you know, is so wrong. I don't understand what's so wrong about that. As long as they have what they need, you know, what they're looking for is that functionality, as I mentioned. They'll go into an unnatural environment on their own in the wild because it provides them what they need. So that's what snakes are looking for. So when we have a snake in captivity, it should never have to worry about predators. It shouldn't ever have to seek food. It should never have to go seek water. And obviously if it's on one side of its cage and the water dish is six feet away, yeah, it's gotta go seek water. But it's a lot different than, you know, having to travel a mile because it's a dry season and they've gotta go find water and their water source is dried up. It's a lot different. It's a lot different stress level for the animals. Um, and that is an important thing to consider in your keeping too. If you do want to use more naturalistic setups and you're keeping an ambush species, I would recommend multiple water sources in there and make sure at least one of them they can drink from cover. Because some snakes, and especially with short tails, if they're nervous, they'll, they'll sit in where they're hiding and they won't go seek that water if it makes them nervous to go over there. They'll literally dehydrate themselves. And there's other species that do the same thing. So you wanna make sure if you're doing that, that you're providing the animal with a way that it can drink without having to expose itself. You don't wanna force it into that situation. So uh, I would keep multiple water sources in a setup like that. And even with my olive python, she's in a big cage. I, I have a water dish on each side of her cage just for her own convenience. Um, you know, I don't want her to have to stop thermoregulating to go get a drink. If she wants to bask, she can bask and drink. If she wants to be on the cool end, she can be on the cool end and drink. Just a personal preference for me, I just like to do for her. Um, not necessarily necessary, she's a very confident animal. I just feel better about it. So, like I said, we wanna maintain that homeostasis. So that's the most important thing, is keeping that cage environment within the realm of the parameters that this animal needs physiologically. You know, this animal needs a certain temperature, it needs a certain humidity in order to survive, in order to properly digest food in order to shed all these different things that they have to do. So that is not something you can compromise on. That has to be there for a long-term, you know, healthy environment and a healthy animal. Uh, so as far as enrichment goes, you know, like I said, keep in mind captivity versus the wild, what these animals know, what they understand. This animal doesn't know what a tree is. And even its wild counterpart, you don't find these guys in trees. They're not built to climb. They'll hurt themselves if they do climb and fall. Um, and you see these, these studies in ball pythons all the time. There's one or two studies that are brought up saying that basically insinuating that ball pythons are semi arboreal because they found birds in their diet. Now, first of all, have you ever been outside before? Birds go on the ground. Second of all, ball pythons are opportunistic feeders. If there's a bird nest that's easy prey, yes, they're going to climb and go get it to eat. Uh, that doesn't mean that they're arboreal, it just means that they they see an opportunity for an easy meal and they're gonna seize it and they're willing to risk a fall to get that food. 
Now that said, the species of bird that you look at in those diets are species of bird that nest on or close to the ground. So these guys aren't going up into the canopy, you know, going after birds. They're going into a bush. They're not really going into a tree. And that doesn't mean you can't find one in a tree. Like I said, animals that are trying to survive out in the wild are gonna do whatever it takes to survive. Even if that means stepping outside their niche, they're gonna do that if that's what they have to do. In captivity, they should not have to do that. So you look at the structure of these animals and you see that a fall can be risky to them. You know, you look at the structure of a, an adult reticulated python that's not stuffed into obesity, that's a 15 foot snake that should be able to scale a tree very easily. They are semi-arboreal animals. They spend a lot of time up there. Um, they'll hunt food up there. They'll, they'll definitely, you know, sit up there and do different things. Uh, same with carpet pythons. Carpet pythons are equally comfortable on the ground or up perched. Uh, and then you get into your arboreal species where they really need that for their, their well-being. Uh, so the other benefit to enrichment that I've seen is like muscle tone and the animal's weight and health in that regard. And now, to me, we all know diet and exercise work together. So it's important to have a proper diet for your snakes. Varied diet is very good. Look at what the species naturally eats because that's what their body is going to be designed for. And in captivity, most of us feed, you know, Norwegian rats, which are not native to most places that our snakes come from. So we're feeding an unnatural food source from the get-go, uh, primarily, because that's what's readily available. Uh, so we need to make sure that we keep that in mind and that we tailor their diet as best we can. If you can mix in some birds, if you can mix in some other types of rodent. Uh, and just get some variety in there, mix up their meal size, mix up their meal frequency and duration. All that stuff helps with keeping and helps them keep trim and in shape like they should be. And also simple stuff like what I'm doing here handling, as she's crawling through and holding on and changing positions, I'm probably gonna annoy her a little bit, um, you know, she's working her muscles. So that's good for them. So handling can be beneficial as long as it doesn't stress the animal out. If it's overly stressing the animal out, then it's not something you really wanna push. So in that case, I definitely would look to get more of that from their cage environment. I have my animals out all the time. Obviously I have a lot of them. So this individual might not be out, you know, every single week or every single day or whatever it is, but I do take them all out and I do work with them all with the exception of my big female white lip. She just does not wanna be handled. And so we do things differently with her. Uh, but these guys are designed to stay in pretty good shape as long as their diet's good. They really don't need exercise to stay strong, but it doesn't mean that it can't be beneficial in a part of your routine. Uh, so if you have snakes like this that are comfortable with handling, it is good to take them out, sit on the couch for an hour while you're watching TV, you know, just let them move around, crawl around, encourage that. I like to take my snakes outside. Uh, I'm not saying take them to the local park, take them to whatever, but go out in your yard if you can, if it's a safe environment, make sure you're not using all kinds of pesticides and things of that nature and, and taking them out there. You know, I've lived in the same place for 11 years. There's never been any pesticide used in this lawn. So I know that it's safe to take them out there. Uh, and I know what's going on. And be aware of your surroundings when you do take your snakes outside. There's holes that they can dive into. Uh, watch for birds of prey. Birds of prey love snakes. They will come out of nowhere and grab them. So you wanna make sure you're always weary and always vigilant if you're taking your snakes outside that it's in a safe environment uh, and that you keep, keep a watchful eye. And make sure they're comfortable out there. I have a few snakes that don't like outside. They get very nervous, very freaked out, very defensive. So I don't take them out there. It's just, you know, maybe once a year just to see if they've gotten over it and go through it. If it's still that way, then I don't do it. But a snake like her, she'll go outside, you know, twice a week in the summer and she's cool with that. Uh, she'll cru cruise around, she'll explore, she'll periscope, she'll get some sun, the natural UV, which UV has been found that it can be beneficial. Um, it is not necessary, uh, but it's really not gonna hurt them either. But I prefer go straight to the natural source as opposed to, to doing it in a cage environment. I like their cage to be somewhere where they don't have to be subject to that light. They can, they can be out of it if they want to. The natural light coming in the room seems to work enough for me. So mind you, as I said, a lot of this is my opinion, but it's also based on the results of all these studies. It's based on years of keeping and seeing what these animals do, what they need, where they thrive, where they seem to do the best. Uh, so I think that while enrichment is certainly not necessarily a negative thing, I think we need to stop trying to tell people that if you're not providing it for certain species that you're uh, you know, being detrimental to the animal. You know, it's a, it's a case by case basis, species by species. Uh, if you are getting an animal out of the wild, it may help them acclimate to be in a more natural environment. 
but an animal that was born in captivity that was born in a tub with some vermiculite or you know perlite or hatchrite or whatever you use you know sim containers they don't know what grass is they don't know what a tree is they don't know what a bush or a plant or a rock is to them it's no different than you know a plastic hide or a, you know, multiple layers of newspaper or aspen or cypress mulch or any of that stuff that people use. There really is no difference to this animal. It doesn't understand the difference. And as I said, even when you go out and you field herp for wild snakes, you often find them in unnatural places because it functions for what they're looking for. And above all else, functionality for what they need to me is the most important thing. More important than how it looks, more important than what I think about it, it's how does it work for them. And so I think when you're evaluating your animals, you need to put yourself out of the equation and see what's gonna work best for the animals. Uh, and I welcome you know opinions and feedback and whatever on this. And if anybody has studies uh, that show you know definitive results beyond what I talked about, I would love to see them. I always love to read that stuff and see. I certainly have seen that stuff in lizards and other animals, but I have not seen in snakes where it showed any definitive um, you know, positive results outside of problem solving ability and outside of, uh, you know, muscle and body tone. I haven't seen anything to do with longevity, you know, anything to do with overall health, you know, bacterial load, any of that stuff. I would love to see some of that if it's out there. All right. Thanks, guys. We'll see you. Minnie Lilith and I are out.